these are m agents, a set m of m indivisible items, and an allocation is a partition of the set of items into n disjoint bundles, giving uh, each agent one of the bundles. So for example, here the red agent got uh, the sun and the moon, and the green <coughs> agent got the star and the cloud. And we are, we'll deal here <coughs> with settings without payments. So agents do not pay uh, the allocation mechanism or pay each other to receive desirable items. Uh, also, if items are undesirable, they are not paid in order to agree to receive them. This doesn't mean that there no money is involved in the sense that items themselves, themselves cannot have money as part of the items. So for example, an item can be a wallet with some money in it, but then it's treated as one item and you don't pay for getting this wallet or something like that uh, based on the amount of money in there. It's just an item. So there's a whole class of allocation mechanisms like auctions and things like that, which um, we shall not address here, in which the decision of which agent gets which item depends on how much they're willing to pay. Uh, we are not doing this here. Uh, so examples of settings that are more related to what we're doing, it can be allocation of housing units to eligible residents, let's say, in these cases, let's say, dormitories. Um, so the question of what you get doesn't depend on, uh, like, usually a bidding mechanism or something in which you pay money, but let's say the university allocates the dorms or NBA draft, drafting basketball players to teams in uh, the American Basketball League. Uh, again, there's a selection process in which teams select players, and uh, this is based on uh, just a certain order in which they choose the players. Uh, dividing an inheritance among uh, the heirs, uh, or al the allocating admittance receive or academic chores to members of a faculty, so usually no transfer of money is involved there. <coughs> so usually if there's no money involved, you want some solution which is fair in some sense, an allocation that is fair in some sense. So the goal of this talk is to introduce some of the fairness benchmarks that used in the study of fair allocation of indivisible items, present some of the key results associated with these benchmarks. So it's a selection of results, and uh, so there are other results, we'll not uh, uh, describe all of them. Another goal is to introduce people here to proof techniques that are used, so let's say unlike this morning's talk, there will be proofs here, and uh, go. Will, so will there be code? No code. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the choice of the <coughs> proofs to show are those which appear to me to be more elegant and uh, informative. So, uh, like maybe proofs that you might also remember, and to present some open questions. So when we allocate the items, one way of doing it is by an allocation algorithm. So what is an allocation algorithm? What does it does? The, uh, what does it do? So first we need some assumptions on what the agents actually want. So this uh, we formulate through the notion of evaluation function, uh, which says for each bundle of items, how much this bundle is worth for the agent. So this is evaluation function, like how much is it worth for me if I get, let's say, this particular housing unit. And uh, we assume that the social planner, the one running the algorithm, has some desirable goal, maybe some fairness goal, concerning uh, what the agent should receive at the end. And uh, the way we think of an allocation algorithm, it gets as input the true valuation functions of the agents, and it computes an allocation <laughs> of the items to the agents. And so there's a minor point that we should 
not uh, discussed here is uh, sometimes the valuation functions can be very complicated, stating for every subset of items its value, so it can be exponentially large in the number of items. So there's a question of how these valuation functions are represented, but this will not be a concern here, so uh, let's ignore it. Another way of allocating the items is through an allocation gain. It's a similar and different in some sense. Uh, so there's no central algorithm that uh, computes the allocation. Instead, uh, each agent, like there's a certain gain that has certain rules of how you can follow the game. And uh, in this game, in a sense, the agents choose the items according to the rules of the game. And the rules of the game are simple enough such that uh, like anyone can see if you are following the rules or not. Um, and the outcome is determined by the game. So it's not that a, a central planner has to decide what are like the desirable allocations. Somehow this is what comes out from the game, the allocation. So different <coughs> agents can have maybe different goals in this game. And uh, let's say if they have different fairness notions that they believe in, they might tailor their strategies in the game to achieve their desired goal, goal and not necessarily the one of some central planning agency. But, you know, if, if, if I was a central algorithm and allocation game formal, it's not so easy because you can say any allocation algorithm is a game in the sense that you can supply to it whatever valuation function that you have. So I think the distinction would be that for a game, the rules are simple, so it's obvious to you how and why you got the particular allocation that you got. If this is the way you play the game, and that's like what actually happened, Whereas for an uh, allocation algorithm, the way I think of it, it might be doing some mys mysterious computations that if you only know what you supplied, it's difficult for you to figure out whether <laughs> you actually got the right allocation or not, maybe. So maybe a game is like more transparent in a sense to the players. A different way to look at it is that Alex, he, he speaks about the expect, expected for games and not the right correlation. So uh, I'll be like, it's like pick an item in sequence. So, so, games. Yeah. Right. so we'll see examples of this game. The point is that the rules of the game are simple. Like, uh, it's kind of obvious what's going on in the game. So how would, if we use a uh, game as an allocation mechanism, uh, like uh, how do we analyze what happens in the game? Uh, okay, uh, agents can do whatever they want. So again, we assume agents have the evaluation functions that assign values to sets of items. And, uh, and a simple example would be an additive valuation where each individual item has a value and the value of a set of items is a sum of values of the individual items. And we assume, let's say if we want to prove that the game has a certain property, we assume that indeed the agent has the goal of achieving these properties. So for example, wants to achieve a bundle of certain value at least. And then we design strategies for the game, for the agent how to play the game, I, that if the agent follows this strategy, he will surely attain the goal no matter how the other players play, no, no matter how the agents game, uh, other agents uh, play. So in this sense, we, this would be a good game for the allocation problem if the goal of the agents are such that they have safe strategies that guarantee that they can get these goals. So we'll see examples. <coughs> okay, so we'll start uh, by discussing the setting in which agents have equal entitlements to the items to begin with. So they're all equal, like, uh, okay. Later we'll discuss also cases where some agents are entitled to receive more than other agents. So this is a fairly standard setting where we assume everybody a priori is equal. So perhaps uh, the 
simplest uh, game for allocations is the well-known cut and choose uh, protocol. So here, these are Abraham and Lot. So uh, in the biblical story, like they are both in the land of uh, Canaan at the time, and uh, they want to be in separate places. So Abraham says, you know, divides the land, says, I'm willing to go either left or right, but Lot, you choose, you choose which way you go, I'll go the other way. And we'll stay each one with our people at a different location. So one player cuts, Abraham says, I partition the land in two parts, and the other player chooses which part to go to. So we have two agents of equal entitlement. We have, let's say, a set of in maybe in land is maybe this is visible, so we can have indivisible items. And what is the game? Player a, a cuts, so he partitions the items into two subsets. And then player B chooses chooses one of the subsets of the item, and the player A gets the remaining part. So suppose that's a natural assumption that the player that has a private valuation function wishes to maximize the value of the bundle that she receives. It's an assumption. Okay, because uh, we don't know. Maybe what the player wants is that the other player would be happy. They can have other goals, but generally this is the kind of goal we assume that players have, to get as much as they can from the allocation. So in this case, player B has a dominant strategy of what to do. Like once player A um, made a cut, Player B should choose the part which is better for her. So that uh, of higher value according to her own valuation function. So for her it's quite clear what she should do. What is the strategy for A? Maybe it's a bit less clear because it depends what B would do. You know, we don't know. Maybe if you cut in one way, B would choose the part and leave you something which has very high value for you because you don't know how B will react. So it's not so clear what the best strategy for A in this game is. Uh, so this allocation game is used in practice, like uh, okay, when people cut a cake, uh, often one cuts, the other chooses. Uh, so in what sense is this game fair? Like what fairness notion come out of this game? And we use this game as a way of introducing classes of fairness notions. So let's first uh, talk about the cutter. Um, what can the cutter guarantee uh, to himself? So in general, even let's say when there are n agents and you want to cut into n parts and let the other agent select, so uh, then the player can partition the items into n parts and uh, what can he guarantee to himself if he knows nothing about what the other pairs are going to select, like under a veil of ignorance, doesn't know which part he will receive it. <coughs> the way he'd like to cut is that the least valuable part, if he's risk averse at least, is that the least valuable part would still has as high value as possible. So this is a kind of cut that he would use in this case. And this value of the least valuable part in a partition into n parts is called the maximum share. And this is the value that the, the cutter can guarantee to herself. <coughs> okay, so this is the maximum share. And then a safe strategy in the cut and choose protocol is for A to cut according to this maximum share, so he cuts it into a part S and the rest. Uh, in a maximum way, such as the minimum value of the two is as large as possible. And this safe strategy is guaranteed to give the cutter at least her maximum share. So just as a comment, <coughs> I'm not saying that it's easy for the cutter to decide how to cut, in general, finding the optimal cut might be NP-hard to compute. 
but uh, we are not concerned here with uh, computational issues, so let's ignore this issue here, okay? So in principle, this is what the cutter should do, uh, can do. So this is a certain fairness benchmark that the cutter can meet in the cut and choose protocol. The cutter can ensure to herself the maximum share. So a certain minimum value that she get at the end. She might eventually get more than that, but that's a minimum that she can ensure for herself. And in this respect, maybe, the protocol is fair to the cutter because it can offer her this currency. In what sense is the protocol fair to the chooser? So this is the notion of envy freeness. So envy free means that looking at what I got and comparing it to what each other agent got, I think that I got the best bundle. Nobody else got a better bundle than I did. So a safe strategy for the chooser, ensuring it is choose the part that she prefers. And this is also true if we cut into, let's say, where there were end players and I'm the first player to choose. Okay? Then if I'm the first player to choose, I can choose the part that I prefer most, and I prefer it more than any of the other bundles that other agents got. So this safe strategy guarantees that the chooser will not envy uh, the other player. <coughs> okay, so we can ask, uh, does the chooser get the guarantee of the cutter? Does the cutter get the guarantee of the chooser? So does the chooser get the help? maximum share. Is that true? Okay. You see no evaluation. Okay, so that's exactly the issue here. So suppose that uh, the four uh, items are four um, tickets to musicals. Okay. So two for the Wizard of Oz and two for Wicked. And suppose that the cutter, A, is a person who likes to go along to musicals. So for him, what he wants is one ticket for The Wizard of Oz and one ticket for Mi Wicked, and then he can go to two musicals and he'll be happy. And suppose that the chooser is a person who goes to musicals only with a friend, he doesn't go along, or she doesn't go along. So only pairs of tickets to the same show have some value for her, okay? because she will not go, if yes, she has a single ticket to a show, she will not go. So in this case, the maximum share for a, the chooser agent B, she would like the partition to be either two tickets to Wizard of Oz or two tickets to Wicked. Any one of these pairs is good for her, so it has high value for her, any one of these pairs. So for her, her maximum maximum share value is the value of a pair of tickets to the same show. Because there are only two agents, she should get a pair of tickets to one of the shows. But what would the cutter do? The cutter uh, prefers one ticket for each of the different shows, so she'll cut in a different way. So even though the chooser would choose something she would not envy the cutter, she does not get her maximum share because she, in fact, doesn't get anything of any value for her. Okay, so envy freeness does not mean that you get high value. You might not envy the others because you also think the others didn't get high value. Okay, so now let's look at the cutter. Is the solution envy free from, like, can the cutter get the guarantee of the chooser? So here we'll have um, we introduce the notion of MB3 up to one, up to any good, ESX. So here we look at the case where the items are good, have non-negative marginal value, meaning agents want to get the items. It's not something that they'd rather not get. And here's a variation on MB3 ness that's MB3 up to any item. So in this case, we say that the location is MB3. If let's say player A prefers her bundle of, over that of any other agent, let's say that of agent <coughs> B. Uh, if 
any single item is removed from the bundle of the other agent. So it doesn't have to be that the value of my bundle is better than the value of the other bundle, but if I remove any item from the other bundle, then my bundle is at least as good. And in this case, the strategy, if uh, for the cutter, if he cuts it into two bundles uh, in a maximum way that we described, the one giving the maximum share, minimizing the value of the minimum of the two bundles, also ensures the, that the allocation would be NV3 up to any item. Because if, let's say, the minimum of these two, let's say S, uh, has, let's say, value smaller than the rest, then if I, <laughs> if it is the case that I remove an item from here and this val still has value larger than this, then I'd have a different cut. I remove the, this item. To begin with, I'd start with the cutting with this extra item is in S. Um, so this would be an EFX uh, allocation. Um, so the cutter gets two guarantees, really, in this cut and choose game. He gets both a share-based guarantee, he gets at least his maximum share, and he also gets an NB-based guarantee, the EFX. And of course, the chooser also, the chooser gets something which is NV3, so of course it's also EFX, which, because NV3 is a stronger property. Okay. So let's look now at the case where the chooser has an additive valuation function. So this is a special case of valuation functions, but it is a common special case, not necessarily in practice, but in the literature, so <laughs> it's very common. <laughs> okay, because it's easy to work with it. Uh, so what happens in this case? Um, so, so first of all, uh, if you're additive, then the chooser does get her maximum share because the maximum value uh, of two bundles, let's say, is at least um, the half the total value of everything, uh, which is at least the MMS, so she does get it, but again, she gets even something, let's say, let's propose something stronger than M the MMS. We'll call it the max expectation share. So the MMS was, uh, we, someone proposes a partition of the items into n parts and gets the worst part, a somewhat better benchmark would say, let's say I propose that the benchmark in expectation, not in worst case, is I par propose a partition into n parts and I expect to receive a random part. Why would, should I, why would they get the worst part? maximum expectation share uh, is the expected value that you would get in under the best partition, such partitions, in which you partition them into n parts trying to maximize the expected value that of a random part. So if you're additive, if your valuation is additive, in fact it doesn't matter how you partition, if you get a random part in expectation you get one over n of the total value. If you're not additive, then there, it does, might matter how you do the partition. So the maximum expected share is always at least as large as the, as the MMS, because you get a random part instead of the worst part. And for additive valuation, in which the value of a set is the sum of values of individual items, it's just the proportional share. So for additive valuation, it's proportional share, one over n of the total value of all items. For non-additive valuations, it's something different. So it's, you can think of it also as some extension of the proportional share to non-additive valuations in a way that maybe makes more sense than looking at the proportional share. When you're not additive, looking at the value of the whole bundle and dividing by n maybe does not make much sense, yeah, whereas this does make 
So we say strategy for the chooser was to choose the part of highest value, and this uh, is NV3, and with ad additive valuation, it gives at least the MMS and at least also the MES, the maximum expecta expectation share. So you get both these guarantees. So you both get an X, uh, a share-based guarantee, and uh, if you are additive, and an NV-based guarantee. And so for additive valuation, both the cutter and the jewels are get at least their MMS. And for the chooser even gets more than their MMS in terms of share, or maximum expected share. <coughs> so since they, they don't get exactly the same guarantees, cutter and chooser, we can try a random order, cut, cut and choose. We choose at random who the cutter is and who the chooser is. It makes sense. Uh, and then we can ask what each one of them gets. <coughs> what the now they are symmetric, so what they get ex ante, meaning an expectation, what they can ensure for themselves, and what they can get ex post in the final allocation for sure. So uh, ex ante is NV3, no one envies. So you, ex ante, uh, no one really, okay, envies the other player, and uh, for additive valuations, uh, you get at least your maximum expected share. And uh, X, which is at least your proportional share, you get at least half the value. Okay, X, I, I, it needs a proof, but uh, it's easy to prove it. That X ante in this random order, you get at least half the total value. And X post, no matter what happens, the solution would be you get at least your MMS. Uh, sorry, you, it, you get at least EFX and you free up to any item. And if you have additive valuations, you get at least your end, maximum share. So in a sense, this is what we call a best of both world results. So with respect to NV benchmarks, so with respect to NV, X ante, you get the best thing you can hope for, NV3. And X post, you get the best that you can hope for, NV3 up to any item. You cannot hope for anything better. And if you have additive valuations, it's also best of both worlds with respect to the share best benchmarks. X ante, you get maximum expectation share, which is the best you can go hope for. And X post, you can get the maximum share, which again is the best you can hope for. So here's a summary of some fairness benchmarks that we uh, went over. So we had share based fairness benchmarks which had one was the ex-post one, which was the maximum share, the MMS. <coughs> and the other was the ex-ante one, the max, ex max expectation share. And there were the NV-based uh, benchmark. So ex-ante, there's NV-freeness, uh, which can hold an ex-post, NV-3 up to any item. And we also saw that for general valuations, envy and share-based benchmarks are incomparable. Let's say for additive valuations, you'd rather be envy free than get your MMS key, because envy free guarantees that you also get your MMS, but not the other way around. But if you're not, your valuation is not additive, then it might be that it's better for you to get your maximum share, whereas in an envy free allocation, you might get very little value. so far. Yes, please. You. Since the uh, since the cutter might not know very much about the the chooser's uh, valuation, it's quite possible that after the division has been made, there there could be a desirable trade that the two could make. Okay. Uh, this seems to be um, so the chooser is going to choose the part that she prefers, right. but well, it that, might that be... Is, it might not be for able efficient. It might not be, okay. Yeah. So that's true in general, okay. So maybe a word about Pareto efficiency. So an allocation is Pareto efficient. If there's no other allocation mm -hmm. that everybody prefers over the current allocation, or at least weekly prefers, so some 
people get at least as much value and some get more. Okay. Um, so regarding Pareto efficiency, if agents all they care about is share-based notion, fairness notions, only how much they care about, then you can say that for any allocation protocol after it ends, agents can look at what they got and maybe trade somehow exchange the items between them to get improvements. So we can make the assumption if we ignore computational issues of computing how to reach a Pareto efficient allocation, that in share-based notions, the final allocation, no matter what the protocol is, at the end we do another stage and we reach a Pareto efficient allocation that dominates the current allocation and so um, the shareness guarantee still hold. If you're looking at ND3 notions, agents might not want to do Pareto improvements because this may create envy. So in these situations, it's not clear that Pareto efficient allocations are what the agents want. So I'm happy if you get less. So it's not, uh, so in these cases, we don't worry about Pareto efficiency. <coughs> people really, if we take NV seriously, and some people do take it seriously. Okay. It's one of the weaknesses of NV-based uh, It's a weakness if you believe in Pareto efficiency in the world, but uh, <laughs> like if, uh, so I, I used to think very negatively of NV until, uh, uh, okay, I had uh, my granddaughters at home for, uh, like, and we were having dinners, girls and only two, two pink plates. Okay. <laughs> and then they started arguments and crying and so on and the only solution was nobody gets a pink plate. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to appreciate that for some people envy is really like they accepted the solution that nobody gets a pink plate <laughs> but they did not accept the solution that two get it and one does not. Okay. So... So for some people, it's very important thing. Okay, so here's a major open problem in fair allocation. So do ND3 EFX allocations always exist? ND3 up to any item? We don't know that. Uh, what do we know? We know special cases in which they <coughs> do not exist. So one we've seen, when there are only two agents, they always exist by the cut and shoot protocol. For three agents, they are known to exist if valuations are additive, and uh, a bit more generally, but not for general classes of valuations. This is an open problem. And for four or more agents, we don't know if they exist. If all agents have the same valuation function, they are also known to exist. Uh, it's basically... Okay, max lexi mean allocation, basically something similar to you do an MMS partition or in a clever way of uh, the items with respect to this valuation, and it would be EFX. You need to work a little. Yeah. There's a weaker notion than EFX, EF1, which means uh, that the NV can be removed by removing from the other bundle a specific item, <laughs> not any item, but maybe the item of highest possible value. And this removes the envy. So under this notion, um, if one allocations are known to exist for any class of valuation functions, additive or not, any monotone valuation function, and we'll see a proof of this later. So this is one of the proofs that I will show. But are, are you saying there are no counterexamples? No known counterexamples, no. For, for a general? No, no. So this is a, like, it was called by, by, by Ariel Procaccia, let's say, the most important open problem in the third division. I'm not sure I agree, but <laughs> it's a, a well-known open problem, open for a long time, a long, long in, long here is 10 years or something like that, not that long. And uh, 
EFX, it, we don't know if it's feasible or not. MMS, we know, is not feasible. We already saw an example where, uh, like, one player wanted a division along the rows, the other wanted a division along the columns, and you, you cannot satisfy both of them. Uh, the interesting thing is that even if valuations are additive and the number of agents is at least three, then there are instances in which there is no MMS allocation. So it seems like, it doesn't seem like such a strong benchmark for additive valuations. So you just want to get the worst bundle <coughs> in maybe the best partition that you can offer. So you're not asking for very much, certainly. You're not asking for your proportional share, maybe you're asking below, but still, even in the additive case, you cannot satisfy it. So this is the smallest negative example, uh, probably the smallest negative example. So in this example, there are three agents. There's no negative example with the two agents. In this example, there are nine items. There are no negative examples with fewer items. And uh, so uh, these are the items I arranged them in a three by three matrix and the MMS partition for agent one is along the rows, for agent or uh, R, let's say for agent C for columns it's along the columns, <coughs> and for the other agents it's at least somewhat irregular pattern. The and uh, in this particular uh, for each agent, the total sum of items is 120, so the, their MMS happens to be exactly 40, and in every allocation, it can be shown that every ag some agent gets at most value 39, not 40. And it's a mi minimal example also in the sense that if you put integer values, if the sum of values of one of the agents is less than 120, that is 120, or below, then there is an MMS partition. So, like, there's no negative example. So this is really the, the smallest negative example in several senses. So it, it shows that it's quite difficult to come up with instances in which there's no MMS partition. Because, like, these examples are, you really need to uh, fine-tune them like the values of the items, but uh, the examples do exist. So what do people do? So instead of uh, trying, if you care about share-based fairness notions, in instead of trying to find allocations that give each agent their maximum share, you try to ask, maybe give an approximation of the maximum share, a raw fraction of the maximum share, and then you ask what is the highest possible value of rho for which you can go, uh, guarantee an approximation of the maximum share. That is, for every allocation instance, there is an allocation in which every agent gets at least a rho fraction of her maximum share. So what do we know about this? So for n agents, general n, the best bound which is known following a l long sequence of rows, yes. For this is just for additive valuation. For general evaluation, there's no approximation. For submodular, there is, okay. But uh, once you have complements, you lose okay. any approximation. For sub-additive, it's not clear if you have a constant approximation or not, it's open. But for submodular, constant is known. For additive valuation, so it's somewhat <coughs> better than three quarters. So the point is that it's more than three quarters, three quarters plus a little. And this is following a long line of work where it started with uh, two thirds and uh, it was improved to various versions of two thirds, three quarters. And when I say versions of two thirds, so the question is can you give two thirds with a polynomial time algorithm, yes or no? And likewise with three quarters, we had similar problem. And now it's slightly above three quarters. And if the number of agents is small, you can do much better. So let's say for three agents, uh, it's at least 11 over 12. Maybe it's even better, the approximation ratio. So that's the current state of the art. 
for additive valuations over goods. So if there are three agents, the best approximation ratio known is 11 over 12, and the negative example that I showed shows that for three agents, there are examples showing that it's no better than 39 <coughs> over 40. For four agents, the approximation, known approximation ratio deteriorates to four over five, but also the negative examples deteriorate, get closer to one, 67 over 58, and for N agents, I said it would have somewhat above three quarters, and the negative examples that we know continue to deteriorate, they come closer and closer to one. So in all the cases, the existence results are by allocation algorithms, not games. Like uh, it's not that there's a simple game that you can offer in which they get this approximation ratio. You really ask for the full valuation functions to a complicated computation and output the allocation. Okay, so now let's go to some games. So the first uh, class of games would be games uh, of the ones which we study here, uh, games based on picking sequences. So these games proceed in rounds. In each round, one agent gets to pick an yet unallocated item of her choice, and she gets this item. And the rules of the game only say whose turn it is to pick in a certain round. So you can have different picking sequence games with different rules of who is the next player to choose an item. And it might also be made be randomized. Maybe you toss a coin and a random agent choose. So these are the games. So we'll discuss a few examples. One is serial dictatorship. So uh, this is the case in which every, okay, we'll see in a minute. And uh, a randomized version of it, random serial dictatorship. The other picking sequence we'll consider is what's known as round robin. And, late, and then we'll talk a little bit about allocating chores. These are items of negative value and look at picking sequences for chores. So what do we know about, uh, okay, what is random serial dictatorship? Is this is something that is actually used in practice. Uh, and it's used when agents have unit demand, meaning each agent gets just one item. For example, uh, in Mechir Lamishteken, when we allocate uh, apartments to eligible uh, persons uh, in Israel, uh, there's a lottery that determines the permutation over these agents, or the elig eligible agents, and then each agent in this term can choose a unit. And of course, in these games, there's a safe strategy, a dominant strategy for an agent. Once it's her turn to choose, choose the best uh, item among those which still remain. So it gives each agent, if you see what the MMS for unit demand valuations is, it gives the, unit demand, uh, the MMS exposed. And if the permutation of the over the agents is uniformly random, it gives also the max expectation share ex ante. So in this respect, it's a good allocation mechanism if each agent is to get only one item. And it's a mechanism which is used in practice. Is it optimal? Are there better mechanisms? So in terms of its worst case guarantees, it is optimal. It gives the best possible guarantees. But on particular instances you can do better sometimes. There are other ordinal mechanisms in the sense that all they need to know is which, what is the order of the items, which item you prefer over which other item that, give, that stochastically dominate RSD, meaning that a priori if you look the, at the probability <laughs> of that you get each particular item, you'd prefer to use these other mechanisms over random serial dictatorship. And moreover, if you actually know the values of the item, you can certainly do better. So here's an example. So let's say there are three items and three agents, and all agents rank the items in the same order. Two of them uh, think that the middle item is not worth much, more than the lowest item, whereas the third one thinks that the middle item is pretty good, pretty close in value to the first item. So in this case, a better if you just do random serial dictation,
dictatorship, each one gets an item at random, really. So the total value for each one of all items together is 12. So on average, you get 4 in expectation. But if you give item E, the second item, to agent C, agent C for surely gets 5. And each of the other agents get in expectation also 5. So they would get better than in random serial dictatorship. So random serial dictatorship is not optimal if you know the valuation of the items. You can do things that all agents would prefer that you do them over random serial dictatorship. So why is random serial dictatorship used in practice and in really in high state settings like housing allocation to get the objects worth it? a lot of money, why would you not go this little extra work of uh, doing better allocation mechanisms? So computer science has many answers. In random serial dictatorship, you have dominant strategies, so that's nice to have. And there's very low communication, that's also nice to have. You only need to communicate when it's your turn to choose an item. But I think that in practice, this is not the reason why it's not used. Uh, in practice, you have other concerns, and one is uh, legal convenience. What happens, let's say, with this housing unit? Really, agents pick the units one by one, but they need to sign a contract once they pick an item. So, the way it works, uh, the question is what happens when it's time for an agent to, and it happens in Mechir Mishtaken, for example, that you win in the lottery, but you don't want uh, the apartment project in which you want it. Some people don't take what they want. So it, uh, you use random serial <coughs> dictatorship when you get to sign a contract. If you refuse to sign, then previous agents who did sign have no regret because they already chose an item that they prefer over the one that you did not take. And those who did not yet get an item also don't complain because you don't get the item. So everybody is happy if you don't sign. Nothing happens. But if you look at more complicated mechanisms that compute the full allocation, and then at some point some people said, we don't want the apartment that was allocated to us, now you need to recompute the full allocation for everyone or somebody is going to regret what happened. Uh, this is a big mess. So in, in terms of practical implementations, it's very easy to work with random serial dictatorship. So this is just a note about Mechir Lemishtaken for those who know it. And so it really has two stages. One stage says in which project you want an apartment. And this is not done exactly using random serial dictatorship. This is done, uh, there are some other rules here. For example, there are priorities for people from certain locations to, choose to get apartments <coughs> in those locations. But once you know in which project you got an apartment, then you, within that project, you do a random serial dictatorship. Yes. So there's, there's a property hiding in what you said now. Maybe if I reallocate things, I would do it in a monotonically increasing way that you're always happier. When someone refuses, yes. I, you can only do better in reallocation. Is uh, that something that anybody ever looked at? So the problem would be just that, uh, like, it would not solve the problem, I would say, because the way you don't sign, everybody sign contracts simultaneously. Yeah, I know, Just of course. You won't be able no, to do it. No, it will in introduce complexity, but there is a, it's a nice property to have all the mechanisms, and no, you, you might get it for free from other mechanisms, right? So, I'm, uh, so I assume that, uh, so there is a question of whether mechanisms have this property, that if an agent leaves, the other gets yeah, only better allocation, so it depends on the mechanism. Suppose some would have you this property, you can some would not. This is the unique, one, the best one in some sense, like the that best has, has this property. If random serial dictatorship yes. is, uh, if somebody lives online, uh, so so the question is like. So you could imagine. That uh, you, you would you imagine you that you. Elicit preferences. Yes. Then you compute an allocation. Then you go serially and say sign contracts. Yes. Every time someone refuses. They leave the game, and you, re you do the recomputation before oh, you go to the, the next rest. one. For, for the, the rest. rest. Maybe. Um, and so maybe you freeze the, you 
freeze yeah. part of the allocation and you monitor it. So random, random serial dictatorship, or in the sense, a random serial dictatorship does it. But we are the computation phase, or the computation phase yeah. is empty. Uh, like, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. So uh, the question is, maybe, right. I don't know. But anyway, I know that this is used in practice, and okay. I've seen it, I've been, I mean, I participated in such a thing. Also, <laughs> so. <coughs> and, uh, Did you buy it? Whether housing units within the Weizmann Institute. Okay. <laughs> okay. Another protocol, well known protocol, is the uh, round robin. So there uh, we have a permutation uh, over the agents. We fix the permutation pi. And then here we allocate not just one item per agent, but many items. So you go over the permutation, each agent selects one item, and then you go over it again, each agent selects a second item, and so on. This happens, for example, in the NBA draft, uh, choosing basketball players for basketball team. There are 30 agents, these are the 30 teams in the NBA, and they choose 60 basketball players, so they go over two rounds of round robin, each, uh, there's a certain variation on it, uh, which uh, happened in the LBA. And the order of the agents is not random there, uh, but uh, it's based on the performance of uh, the teams in the previous season. Uh, they sometimes have trades there. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, this is the basic mechanism. Right. On top of it, they have other things. Um, so what kind of uh, fairness guarantees you have in round robin, so with additive valuations. So for <coughs> additive valuation, it's clear what you need to do if you're risk averse in every time it's your time to pick an item, pick the one of highest possible value among those remaining if you have an additive valuation. Um, if you're not additive, it's not clear which item has highest possible value because thought its value now might look good to you, but after you select another additional items, maybe because of complement, substitute, something like that, you'd regret choosing the item that you chose. Uh, so for equal entitlement, uh, in the round robin, uh, you get the EF1 property that I mentioned before. Um, and if by the permutation over the items is uniformly random, you get also ex ante, the maximum expectation share, or your proportional share, ex ante, in round robin. <laughs> and if uh, pi is sorted, uh, if it's not equal entitlement, let's say if it's sorted in order of decreasing entitlement, then ex post, uh, your ME3 towards lower entitlement agents, if you have additive valuations, and EF1 towards higher entitlement agents. So it has some fairness properties. But in terms of share guarantees, it doesn't have good guarantees. So suppose that there are n agents of equal entitlement, and suppose that they all have the same valuation functions, and there are n minus one a items of high value, and a n items of small value. Then in round robin, uh, the first n minus one agents would all get one large item then the n i agent would get a small item, and then the first n minus one agents would get also a small item. So uh, whereas the MMS of each agent was to get either a large item or all small items, some agent got only one small item, which is a very poor approximation of the MMS. So it's not a good approximation. The round robin protocol does not give a good approximation for the maximum share. And in fact, there's no other picking sequence that you can use that would give a constant factor approximation for the maximum share. Uh, you don't, the, for example, you might think, you know, those who choose uh, first in the first round cho choose last in the second round or things like that, this would not help. So that's the boundary of logarithmic? No, uh, it's logarithmic. So now let's look at chores. So things you maybe don't want to do, but have to do. Um, so these are items of negative value, and they must be allocated. 
So in this case, uh, instead of looking at uh, having negative value, we can say they have positive cost, these things. And instead of a maximum share, we can replace it as a mini-max share. You want a partition that minimizes the maximum bundle, maximum cost bundle. Note that the mini-max share is always at least as large as the most costly item, because anyway you partition the items into n bundles, the most costly item would sit in one of them, and you might get this particular bundle. And for additive cost functions, it's also larger than the proportional share. The most costly uh, bundle would cost at least 1 over n of the total cost. So for chores, if you look at the round robin protocol, then the, you do get a, an approximation of the MMS within a factor of two, and the reason is uh, like a proof <laughs> page. Uh, the last chore, like the most costly one, the one that would be chosen last, cost at most the MMS, and if you remove the last chore, then among the rest, you got only one over n fraction of the total value of the total cost. So if you combine these two things, you see that the approximation ratio is, is no worse than two. So for chores, fitting sequences are good. For goods, they are bad, and for bads, they are good. Okay, the fitting sequences. Uh, and you can get better approximation ratios using fitting sequences for chores. So instead of round robin, there's a different order, sesqui round robin. Uh, so let's say if you have six choosers, the order is one, two, three, four, five, six, six, five, four, and then you repeat. So some agents choose more often than others, but those who choose less often choose first. Uh, so in this uh, order, and then you look at this order backwards as a fitting order, okay? from the end to the beginning. So if you do this, uh, the approximation ratio improves to 5 over 3 for chores, and there are even better picking sequences in which uh, it's the approximation ratio is 1.6. And no picking sequence can ensure more than uh, an approximation ratio better than 3 times. Uh, and also you can have best of all world results for chores because you take the picking sequence and then give a, the, the side at random which identity each agent has, like who's agent number one, who's agent number two. You fix it once at random in advance. So ex ante, you get your maximum ex fixation share, and ex post, you get an approximation. And uh, I should say that if you want even better approximation of the MMS for chores, you don't use fitting sequences at all. There are other algorithms that give better approximations. Okay, so in the last uh, part of the, any questions so far? Yes. What's the motivation behind the sesqui sequence? So the point is that with round robin, as uh, you know, like one player is always in the best position every round, and like the S S SQR, in a sense, th tries to balance it, so to choose that the position of agent in the worst case instances would be somewhat equivalent. But then why don't you go all the way? So one, two, three, four, five, six, and then three, uh, why, why don't you go all the way back? Yeah. It turns out to be better not to go all the way back, mm -hmm. that some players choose fewer <coughs> items than the others. Like, uh, and it's not the optimal, uh, like as I said, we have better sequences than this is. This is a heuristic of how to choose it, but there are better. Like uh, the picking sequences that we have that have a better approximation ratio, you do go all the way back. You go first from 1 to n, then from n to 1. But then you start doing something non-periodic. So, and, uh, and the data are now to be better. So I, I cannot uh, justify why they did what they did. They did what they could analyze. And we think that we may have the optimal picking sequence. We cannot prove that it's optimal. But, uh, Although it is equal entitlement, it's not very equitable. <laughs> yes, but uh, yeah. So a picking sequence, always, there are people in better positions than others, in a sense. But if you 
then assigned random identities to agents you equalize in term of them. Question? Yes. You mentioned that the tilting algorithm is mostly for trolls. Would it also work for you know for, for the normal case? For good. <coughs> for good? So so for trolls it offers a guarantee, a constant factor of approximation of this equivalence of the maximum share or minimax share in this case. For goods, it doesn't offer any constant factor approximation. You can use it, and it is used maybe, let's say in the NDA or things like that. And also, these guarantees come only for additive valuations. If your valuations are not additive, there are no guarantees. It's not clear even what you should pick when it's your turn to pick if your valuation is not additive. And for example, and picking sequences are used even if valuations are not additive. Let's say in the NBA, maybe you wouldn't, you have an option of choosing two players. You wouldn't want to choose maybe two players for exactly the same position. So there are complements, but still you use picking sequences. So I'm saying in practice they can be used without guarantees. We are just saying in which cases they do offer guarantees. <coughs> okay, so now I'd like to show some proof. So we said that EF1 allocations exist, always exist, and they are done using an adaptive picking sequence, not one in which you decide in advance which, picks in, which agent picks in each round, but rather in round R, the agent who gets to pick an item is an agent, you look at what items all agents currently have, you look at an agent that is worst off at this particular point in the sense that everybody thinks okay, I prefer my own bundle over his bundle, and let this agent pick. So as long as there is such an agent, it's clear who, uh, if there are several such agents that nobody envies, then one of them arbitrarily is the one who picks the next item. So the only problem is, what is if there is no such agent? Maybe for every agent, some other agent envies that agent. So let's uh, see how we solve this problem. This is solved through the notion of an NV graph. So in this NV graph, vertices represent agents and their bundles. So we are at some stage in the algorithm. We have, let's say, five agents. And currently, in this intermediate stage of the algorithm, these are the bundles that they have. So for example, agent one has bundle one, agent two, bundle two, and so on. So these are the vertices of this NV graph. Now we can add edges to the NV graph. Edges represent envy. So if in the eyes of agent one, bundle two is better than bundle one, he envies agent two. So we put a directed edge from agent one to agent two. Okay. So what is an agent that nobody envies? It's an agent for which no edge enters this vertex. So if we have such a, in the graph, we have such a vertex, we're okay. But we, it might be that we don't have such a vertex. For example, we might have an envy cycle. So one envy is two, two envy is three, and so on in a cycle. What do we do then? Yeah, so of course, we can then just shift the bundles along the cycle in reverse direction. So agent one would be happy to give up his bundle and get instead the bundle of agent two improve this value. So after we do this reverse uh, cycling, we now have that agent one holds <laughs> bundle two, agent two holds bundle three, and so on. Each one is happier than he was before. It gets a strictly better bundle than what he has before. But still there might be envy, so there might be additional. Now we have to compute, recompute the envy graph. So maybe there will be new envy. So let's get back to the algorithm. So the problem was, what if there is no envy that has no, that every envy, every agent somebody envies that agent, then the envy graph must have a cycle. Okay, it's easy to show. You look at an end agent, if somebody envies him, you go along that edge backwards and look at the, envy, the agent that envied him and ask that somebody envy that agent and so on. So either you close a cycle, or you reach an agent that nobody envies. So you have a cycle. So you can eliminate the cycle, as I showed before. So this gives an allocation that Pareto dominates the previous allocation. So you strictly improve. You st 
still might not have an uh, agent and nobody envies, but you can continue can performing, the, the, you have a new cycle, so you, you do again cycle elimination, and eventually you must reach an agent that no one envies, because at each step you get strictly better allocations, and there are only finitely many allocations, so at some point you must reach an allocation, a situation where you can choose an agent that nobody envies, and this agent can pick the next item. Okay, so this is the whole algorithm. Why does it produce an EF1 allocation? So look at an agent, for every agent J, let's say that a bundle AJ is defined on the bundle that the agent receives. Now consider an arbitrary I, agent I, and we show that no agent will envy I. How do we do that? We look at the last item to enter this bundle AI. So this is the bundle no, no that... No agent envy I up to one group. Yes, up to one group. Up to one group. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it's uh, EF1. No envy I up to one group. Correct. So let E denote the last item to enter AI. So AI was built step by step. It's a is the last item to enter. So note that the time that E entered AI, it could be that some other agent A held the bundle that was AI without the item E, and later, only later agent I received this bundle by doing cycle elimination. So we don't know. So at, some, at that point, some agent A <coughs> held the, the bundle when I entered the bundle. K might be equal to I, K might not be equal to I. Can be either way. Now for every agent J, let's denote by AJ prime, the bundle that J held just before E was allocated. At this point where we, a, item E was selected by this agent K to enter uh, this bundle. So we have for every agent J, the value of her final bundle is at least as good as the value of her bundle at this step where we added a, a item E because all steps can only improve the value of her bundle. This is at least as good as the value of the bundle that this agent K had this at the time that this she selected I before uh, E before she selected E because if K was the agent who selected an item Agent J did not envy her at that point. This was the point of this algorithm, this LNMS algorithm. And this value is exactly the value of AI minus E. So if we remove E from AI, Agent J does not envy. Okay, so this allocation is if one. If the, if the evaluations are additive, Okay, so what changes in what I said here? So first, I did not describe which item uh, an agent takes when it's helpful to take an item. It didn't matter for the analysis at all which item, which item you take. For additive valuations, there's a natural choice of which item a, a, an agent would take, the one of highest value for her. So if the uh, uh, valuations are additive, any addition there what's known as identically ordered, ito. So what does it mean? That all agents agree that, with, let's say, that item one is worth more than item two, and that item, and so on, that and item M is the least valuable item. So we assume, let's say, that the item names satisfy this. Just by renaming, we can do that. So all agree on the order of the items. In this case, the LMMS algorithm produces an EFX allocation, not just EF1, because you don't envy it. Uh, your envy of another bundle is limited to the last item to enter that bundle, and this last item is necessarily the item of least value in that bundle. OK, 
in this case, you get an ESX allocation. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. If for the uh, monotonic state earlier, you said it doesn't matter how they choose their items. Yes. So if uh, an agent tries to choose items in the worst way possible, yes. but they still report their true valuation. They don't need mm -hmm. to report any valuation. In the, in the alcohol, it's a game. Yeah. What we do here is a game, so they don't report any valuation. They just choose items. Well, they need to report who they envy or don't envy. Ah. Yeah, they can. Uh, so, yeah, okay. If I choose yeah. items stupidly yeah. but report envy truthfully, then I'll still get what yeah, I Yeah, 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 yes. So the envy has to com be computed truthfully, but uh, the items, you can choose any. There's no notion of uh, cheating here. You're allowed to really choose whatever you want. You all you need is value queries for general value. The number of cycles that you need to ah, you can show that it's also also polynomial. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> uh, you can count edges. Each cycle removes at least one edge from the graph. Okay. So now uh, the last thing I want to mention is uh, okay, a notion in, in which if x is attained always. So uh, I call it here the EFX share. It's called MFX in other places. So what is the EFX share of an agent? So EFX is an MD-based notion. I want to translate it into a share-based notion. So I can say that my share value is really the minimum bundle, the value of the minimum bundle that I can receive in an allocation that looks like EFX to me. So uh, it's the smallest value, uh, T, so there is a, some bundle B with value T, and there is an allocation, or in a partition into N bundles, such that if I get B, my N B towards any one of the other bundles can be eliminated by removing a single item from this, any item, doesn't matter which one, from each one of these bundles. So from my perspective, I have an EFX allocation, and the... Uh, and a bundle, for me, I'm willing to accept it if its value is at least this t. So I'm not saying that this bundle that I can get is part of some EFX allocation or something like that. Its value is at least as large as the value of a bundle in some EFX allocation. So the EFX allocation it itself, an allocation that gives each agent its EFX share does not need to be an EFX allocation, but in terms of value, it looks like an EFX allocation to each agent individually. But, uh, but the envy might be arbitrary towards other agents. So it's interesting uh, to note that this offers, unlike we said that uh, if one does not offer any guarantee, uh, any constant factor approximation of the MMS, this does offer a constant factor approximation of the MMS for over seven approximation. It's not known if this is tight or not. Maybe it offers a slightly better approximation. <coughs> so this share is feasible. Let's so show first why is it feasible for ADC valuation. You can always give every agent this share value. So the way to argue is you have a certain allocation instance. Think of a hypothetical other allocation instance, which is a Ido identically this um, identically ordered ins val version of your instance. So for each agent I in valuation is on valuation, <coughs> assume that uh, the name. So you keep the valuation a, a function, but you just apply it to this uh, order of the items. Like uh, so, everyone agrees on the order in this hypothetical instance but they keep their own valuation functions. Then using this LMMS algorithm, you find a hypothetical allocation for this hypothetical instance. This is an allocation A prime. And this would be EFX. And now use this A prime to define a picking sequence for your original instance, A. So in every round R, for the original instance, A, the agents who hold ER in A prime, the art item in A prime, is the one who gets to pick an item. 
and now we can pick whatever item he wants. So the point is that in this particular round R, only R minus one items were chosen up to now, so one of his top R items is still available, so we can pick an item of value at least as good as ER in the true instance, now, not in the hypothetical instance. And so the allocation A that he gets, Pareto dominates whatever got in, he got in the hypothetical instance, and because in the hypothetical instance it was EFXS, also in the new instance it, it is EFXS. So this shows that for other evaluations, you can always get at least your EFX share. And in fact, uh, the exactly the same algorithm is known to give a two-third NMS approximation as well. Um, so now, so what was the factor before? Uh, four over seven. For every every EFX allocation, gives you at least four over seven approximation of the MMS. But this particular is even better. This is even better. So uh, now for the last thing, uh, like uh, this is a very recent result, okay? That EFX is feasible for all monotone valuation. You don't need other evaluation. So we need a key lemma here. It says that for any monotone valuation, if, let's say, I look at my EFX share, and suppose that there is a bundle of value which is I don't want to accept it. Its value is less than my EFX share. Then I'm happy. So its value. Oh, sorry, what did I do? Okay, so its value is less than my EFX share. Then I'm happy to give it so this bundle to some other agent and let this agent live. Get a new instance with one less agent and without the items of the bundle. And if I get a bundle that gives me my EFX share in the new instance, it gives me also my EFX share in the original instance. So this is the, the lemma. <coughs> Meaning that if uh, I give some allocation to agent I, does it prevent other agents from getting their share? Uh, this might happen only if the bundle that I receive is a bundle that some other agent also desires. If no agent wanted this bundle, then it's okay to give this bundle to agent I and let him live. For the MMS, this property is not true. And here's an example. Suppose you have six items, so three gold bars and three $10 bills. And the gold bar, believe me, is worth more than $10, okay? So the MMS partition is into these three bundles, if there are three agents. But if some agent takes the $30 and leaves, okay, then the remaining two agents, no longer, one of them would not, no longer be able to get uh, his MMS value, because one of them would get two gold bars, one would get one, which is less than getting a gold bar and a $10. So this property does not hold for MMS. I, so somebody can take a bundle of low value and then ruin the things for the remaining agent. They will not be able to get their MMS. For EFX, this cannot happen. So what is the proof? So um, let, so suppose that uh, some agent took this bundle S that uh, nobody wanted. So now uh, let T be the lowest value EFXS bundle in the new instance. So it, what does it mean? That in the new instance there is a partition of the items into this bundle T and additional bundles in which this does at most EFX and be towards the other bundles, not more. So now I'm saying it cannot be that the value of the bundle S is larger than the value of the bundle T, because then if I would look at this allocation in the original instance, this allocation is, is F, F, EFX with respect to this bundle S, and we assume that it was not. So this cannot be. So it must be that the value
value of t is larger than the value of s. And then if I look again at this allocation, this includes already all items and n bundles. This uh, is an EFX allocation for t because its value is larger than s and its nv is only if x nv sort each one of these bundles in the original instance. So the fact that it was if x in the new instance implies that it is if x in the original instance. Okay, so this is the lemma. So this if x share satisfies two properties that are important for us. This non-prevention lemma means that if somebody takes a bad bundle and leaves, it doesn't prevent the other agents from getting their share of value. And we've seen before, it is feasible when agents have identic identical valuation. This is another property, because we said that EFX allocations exist in this case. So, so every share that satisfies these two properties is feasible. So, okay. Very quickly explain why this is true. So here's the allocation algorithm that shows it. It works as follows. Agent one proposes an EFX allocation with respect to her own valuation function. What does it mean? This is an EFX allocation. For every bundle, it's NV towards the any other bundle can be removed by removing a single item. And such an allocation exists because for identical valuations, EFX if x allocations exist. Then each other agent specify which bundles are acceptable to her in this allocation, which gives her the if x s share. Now here's the key claim. There must be some value of k la larger than 1, such that we can find k agents that can simultaneously each receive a bundle acceptable to her and not acceptable to any other, uh, any of the unsatisfied agents. So we can find k agents that we can give them bundles and let them live, and everybody is happy that they are living because they got bundles that they don't, that the other player, no other player wants these bundles. And so the satisfied agents are satisfied, and the other agents all still have a solution available to them then by induction because now we have a problem with a smaller number of agents. And uh, because of this non-prevention lemma, this solution is also a solution to the original problem. So we only need to prove this claim that uh, there must be case-satisfied agents that can simultaneously receive at this bundle. So okay. Why do you need this simultaneously? Because it's not necessarily that you, you can satisfy it with k equals one. Maybe you there may be no way of choosing one agent that can take a bundle and leave. Uh -huh. Maybe it's necessary that it could be more than one, and this would be an example here. Okay, so here's the proof. It's it's going to be quite short, so I know that it's almost time. Uh, okay, so let's construct a bipartite graph. On one side of the bipartite graph, we will have the agents. So let's say in this example four agents. And in the other side we have the bundles of the EFX partition that agent one proposed. So each one, agent one offered the partition into four bundles. Now we draw edges showing which bundles each agent wants. So agent one who offered the partition, it means that he's willing to get any one of these bundles and it's for <coughs> this bundle gives him his EFXS, EFX share. So, okay, agent two, um, okay, gets, uh, maybe this is on the only bundle that gives him her, her share, and others maybe are not good enough for her. And likewise for agent three, maybe these are their bundles, and for agent four, these are the bundles which are okay. What might happen? If the graph has a perfect matching, then we have an EFX allocation. You give each one of the agents the bundle that uh, a bundle that they want, and they all leave, and we are fine. So the problem is what happens if there's no perfect matching? So now I change the edges. Agent one still wants all bundles, but maybe agent two and three want only bundles.
bundle one and don't want any other bundle. And so you cannot satisfy both two and three simultaneously. Okay? So what happens now? So by Hall's theorem, there must be a set of k plus one bundles that only k agents want. So this is the whole theorem for bipartite matching. So in this example, if I look at these three bundles, there are only two agents that want them. Two and three don't want any bundle here. Okay? So in this case, I can give these two agents each one one of these bundles, and neither two or three wanted these bundles. So they are happy if agent one, agent one and four are happy to get their, uh, these bundles. They get their share value. And agent two and three don't care that agent one and four take these bundles and leave because they did not want these bundles. So this is by this lemma, now agent two and three can continue and get their EFXS share. OK. So let's summarize. So we talked about NV-based fairness notion. For EF1, we said that EF1 allocation always exists, and we showed the proof. And for EFX allocation, it's a major open question if they exist or not. And even for added evaluation, this question is open. For share-based fairness notion, uh, we showed the MMS, and we said it's not a feasible share, not even for added evaluation. For additive valuations, uh, um, we know that some approximation of it is feasible. The best approximation ratio known is in this range here, and determining the best value is open. But we saw a different share, the EFX share, which is feasible not just for additive valuation, but for all monotone valuations. Okay, so this is a summary of this part.